Hey y'all, it's a delight to be here. And uh, with uh, y'all's permission, I'd like to, to start off with a, a poem. And uh, this is from a, from a fellow rascal uh, named D.H. Lawrence. And this poem is called, We're Transmitters. As we live, we are transmitters of life. And when we fail to transmit life, life fails to flow through us. When we fail to transmit life, life fails to throw, flow through us. And if, as we work, we can transmit life into our work, life, still more life, rushes into us to compensate, to be ready, and we ripple with life through the days. Even uh, if it is a woman making an apple dumpling or a man a stool, if life goes into the pudding, good is the pudding, good is the stool. Content is the woman with fresh life rippling through her. Content is the man. Give and it shall be given unto you is still the truth about life. But giving life is not so easy. It doesn't mean handing it out to some mean fool or letting the living dead eat you up. No, it means kindling the life quality where it is not. It means kindling the life quality where it is not. Even if it's only in the whiteness of a washed pocket handkerchief. Thank you, DH. So, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to, to be here with you all this evening. And I'd just like to, to honor the knowledge and experience and dedication that, uh, that is gathered here in this room. And I know you all do good work. Uh, and I know that among us, we have a huge amount of collected knowledge and wisdom that we can apply to setting this world right if we choose to do that. And it's my hope that we will. Um, I'd also like to just uh, honor and appreciate the traditions that I come from. Um, the permaculture tradition and, and movement is one that I've been a part of for a long time. And it's involved literally uh, hundreds of thousands of people going out into the world uh, and uh, sometimes without permission doing, doing good things, restoring life to our planet. And that's really Im Im an important thing. We live in, a, I really love the work of the permaculture movement in a lot of ways because it's so life affirming. You know, if you listen to the news, if you see what's going on in the world, uh, it looks kind of grim sometimes, but you know, a lot of times the, the solutions are actually uh, simple, and in many cases the solutions to some of the challenges that we face are often biological in nature too, even horticultural. And what I want to talk to you all about this evening is uh, what can we do, uh, and how can we re-envision ourselves as uh, you know, and see how we can use the gardening work that we love and horticultural strategies to actually restore abundance to a world uh, in, in great need. And not just abundance, but also restore people to uh, health and well-being and economic prosperity as well. All those things are possible. So uh, we're going to look at how we go about doing that over our time together. I'd uh, just like to start with a Edward Abbey quote. Uh, Society is like a stew. If you don't stir it up every once in a while, then a layer of scum floats to the top. And, you know, so this is just the way it is. So I'm here to stir the soup a little bit. And hopefully uh, it'll work for you all. So I wanted to start off with a little bit of what I find to be really um, disturbing information about the place where we live. Um, and it has to do with local food security and poverty that exist 
uh, around us all the time and often unacknowledged. It's a huge issue for a lot of our fellow uh, inhabitants in Western North Carolina. And I think it's something that, that uh, we as gardeners can actually do something about this in ways that maybe other people can't. You know, I, I, I got this information, the first part of this from an article in the Asheville Citizen Times in 2011. It was, they published their results of a Gallup survey on food insecurity in metropolitan areas. In 2010, when they did that survey, this Asheville metropolitan area that we're in now, Buncombe, Haywood, Henderson, and Madison counties, had the seventh worst food insecurity uh, in the whole of all the metropolitan districts in the country. In 2011, we were third worst. We slipped tremendously in that period of time. So one in every five people in Western North Carolina is food insecure. Um, one in four kids in North Carolina is food insecure. And this is what's really uh, heartbreaking is the level of food insecurity and how it affects the children. Because if children don't get proper nutrition, how are they gonna develop their brains and their bodies to be you know, good citizens in our world and actually make a contribution to making this a more wonderful and beautiful and abundant garden planet. So this is a serious issue that affects the well-being of the future of our world. Um, we source less than 5% of our food locally, and that's in spite of all the, the good works that uh, you know, local food movements in Western North Carolina have been engaged in. Uh, it's still only 5%. As much local food is now available here, it's still a, just a small amount, really. Um, and then I read a really uh, disturbing report about two weeks ago that had just come out on, uh, on public health. And it said that childhood poverty in Henderson, Transylvania, and Buncombe County is up 34% between 2007 and 2014. 34% childhood poverty increases. This is, this is serious business. In McDowell County, it's up 44%. So in, in some of those other counties like Clay County and Cherokee County where there's not many economic opportunities, even higher. So this is not right. This is something that we can actually do something about. We can teach people how to grow food. We can you know, teach children how to grow food. We can teach their parents how to grow food. We can help change this, this percentage. This is an area where gardeners and horticulturalists can make a huge difference in creating more food security for the children in need, you know, in the counties and towns and rural landscapes that we all lo love so dearly. And it can look all different kinds of ways. You know, this is a, a rooftop, and I believe it's New York City, where somebody took a bunch of kiddie pools and filled them up with soil and started planting them. So it's not like this is rocket science, or it's all that complicated. We can actually do this relatively simply. You know, and if we can grow food on a rooftop in New York City, do you think we can grow food in Western North Carolina to feed the people here that are hungry and need that food? I think we can. Uh, this is a, a couple of years ago, I did a uh, volunteer assignment in Angola. And Angola is in southern uh, Africa. And Angola just emerged from a 35-year civil war in uh, 2004, I believe, about 10 years ago. This is a picture I took of a, of a, of a village in Angola. And you can see, in that village, food is very important. They grow food right up to the foundations of the house. Because now, I could say that, you know, it looks to me from looking at this picture, it's mostly corn, and that's what I saw growing there a lot. Um, but, you know, I could, you could actually increase the nutritional value and the diversity and the productivity of those things. And, you know, by shifting from corn to more home garden things, more vegetables, more sweet potatoes, um, you know, more generally nutritious crops and just corn, 
But this is what people that are poor do in other parts of the world. When they don't have something neat, they get out there and they, they plant food and they grow it for themselves. And we, we've kind of lost that tradition around here. I think we're about three generations away. In uh, Western North Carolina, a lot of people left the farms, went to work in the, the factories and moved from the rural areas into towns and things like that. And after two or three years, we kind of lose those self-reliant skills uh, that, that our grandparents' generation had had. And, and so part of this work that we have about, uh, we have to do in this right now is relearn those, those skills or, you know, find out those elder wisdom skills or those, those skills of rural people who knew what it meant to be re responsible for making sure that you got fed and your family got fed by growing a garden for yourself and relearning those skills and, and uh, taking it on uh, out there to a broader level and throughout our communities. I think this is really critical work. Now, um, the title of this workshop was a Neo-Horticultural Revival. And so, you know, I've kind of pointed out some of these challenges and problems that we have. And, and a lot of times, uh, it's hard to look ahead and see where the solutions might lie. Sometimes history might teach us a few things. There might be a, something that we can learn. Maybe people have dealt with some of these kind of situations in the past. Um, and so I wanted to take a real brief look at, uh, at, at human cultural development and, and see where we can go with that and what might be some lessons from some of those previous human societies that we might be able to incorporate into our lives and into our modern day society as well. Well, most of human existence, we were hunter-gatherers or foragers. Uh, and only really recently in the last uh, very brief, you know, the last one or two percent of, of human history have we really emerged and started developing more complex societies than that. But for uh, hunter-gatherer societies actually work pretty darn well. If you looked at the uh, caloric intake and the nutrition of hunter-gatherer peoples, they were getting 24, 2700 uh, calories a day of nutrition uh, in a highly diverse diet. In fact, a lot of the foods that we need to be healthy, we evolved to need during those periods of time, and they aren't really necessarily present in the modern day diet. So, um, so I know that we, there are too many people on the planet, we're not gonna go back to hunter-gatherer lifestyles by and large. Uh, too many people on the planet to even attempt that at this point, but there may be some things that we can learn uh, from them about diversity in diets, seasonally related diets, how, uh, how a, a certain level of nomadism actually conserved and protected the environment uh, that they inhabited, things along those kind of lines. Well, around somewhere around 14, 15,000 years ago, uh, people began to settle in place. And, uh, and, and when they did that, they actually started to look at, at growing plants. Up until that time, it was whatever nature provided for us in the garden of nature was enough for us. But when we settled, uh, it became uh, something that we needed to be able to provide that stuff from closer around. And actually, gardening and horticulture began in the dump heap. Uh, those midden piles on the outside of hunter-gatherer settlements where they would throw the gourd seeds or the squash seeds from the wild relatives of gourds. And then when they would come back and three months, six months, a year later, by golly, there were those plants that were growing there. It was, took a whole lot less energy and calories to harvest them out of the midden piles around your place than to you know, spend that, those calories traveling around trying to find that, uh, those kind of plants. So, it seemed like a good idea to start growing things close to where people lived, and they started to settle. Um, and that period in time, which is called the horticultural societies, as opposed to agricultural societies or hunter-gatherer societies, was, was often ignored and forgotten in the story of human history. Uh, because they jump right from, the story generally jumps almost right straight from hunter-gatherer societies to agricultural societies. But there was this little window of opportunity, lasted three to 6,000 years, uh, in which horticultural societies and people living in small settlements was really the norm. Um, and then we moved on to, uh, to larger 
settlements, people began to realize that they could store and stock and hoard and, and uh, accumulate wealth and power through doing that. And so agricultural societies uh, began to come into play and existed. Uh, and, but horticultural societies didn't just disappear. They existed in parallel with agricultural societies or civilizations. And, uh, and, and in agricultural societies, I said that in hunter-gatherer societies, people were getting about 2,700 calories, 24 to 2,700 calories a day. That number dropped precipitously during agricultural societies' times. And it's led to huge amounts of problems over time. Uh, uh, industrial society is an overlay onto agricultural society. It just takes the same methodologies and rolls it out into other, other areas. And in many places, what we're entering into today may be uh, a post-industrial society. And so um, is that going to be grim or is that going to be a really green and beautiful uh, opportunity for us? Well, that remains to be seen. But the actions that we partake of will have a lot to do with how things end up in the future, you know, the actions that we partake of today. And what I really propose that we consider doing is looking at uh, the going back to those horticultural societies and seeing what was valuable there. What can we learn from those societies about how we can form a new horticultural society to take us into the future? So uh, horticultural societies uh, traditionally were where gardening began. It was actually the origin point of horticulture. It, in order to thrive during those times, you needed to be in an active partnership with nature. That meant you needed to be looking at the clouds and, look, and seeing what the weather patterns you know, foretold and paying attention to the soil and where things grew and where those wild medicinal plants were and what kind of other plants you found around them. Things along those kind of lines, we really had to engage with nature. And we settled in place. We adapted to the limits of place. And this is one of the things that allowed horticultural societies to last for so long because they're very adaptive. They would shift with the, you know, and make adaptations based on the environments that they lived in. Uh, they modified their behaviors to assure community, their community could survive. And they ate a phenomenally healthy diet. They got plenty of rest and play and exercise. And the amount of time that these uh, Stone Age horticultural societies had to spend providing for their needs ran somewhere in the neighborhood of four to seven hours a week, which left a lot of time for play and rest and uh, enjoyment of time with your kids and the families and storytelling and, you know, and all those kind of things that we find ourselves so time challenged to be able to do in our world today. So, um, so I, you know, so they weren't these primitive societies that were uh, just red and hoof and tooth and claw. Uh, so here's where agricultural civilizations usually end up in collapse. If you look at the history of agricultural civilizations throughout time, you'll see that they ultimately extract all their resources, they salt up their soils, they deplete their soils, the climate shifts, and what the population expands and that civilization can no longer support itself and it collapses. Um, this, has been, this has happened again and again and again. What is the Fertile Crescent today? The Fertile Crescent is, is a big desert where people fight a lot, you know, at this point in time. Uh, it's not stable, it's not a healthy place to be. And uh, if you look at Chinese civilizations, if you look at Indian civilizations, all those civilizations have really, uh, you know, even though they may have existed for a fairly long time, ultimately collapsed of their own weight. The Mayas, we, we love to talk about the Mayas in our world and, and wonder why they, that society that seemed to be so far advanced collapsed and what happened? Well. Um, you know, the uh, population grew, the separation between uh, the, hi the hierarchy got very split between the wealthy and the priest class and the peons and the workers. 
you know, was stratified extremely. Uh, they started just building temples to their own uh, grandiosity, and then the climate changed. And their agricultural system failed. And, it, and the civilization could not support that level of separation between the upper classes and the lower classes. And so the Mayan civilization collapsed. But the Mayan people didn't disappear when the Mayan civilization collapsed. What happened to them? They went back to the jungles. They went back to the villages. They went back to their gardens. You go to the Yucatan Peninsula, Belize, Guatemala, uh, those places where the Mayan culture existed, the Yucatan, and, and the Mayan people are everywhere there. The ruins of their civilization were covered up with jungle, as we can see in this picture right here of Tikal. You know? But the people didn't disappear. The civilization collapsed, but the people kept on going. Um, and they're still there today. Coming forward in history a little farther, the Soviet Union. Well, you know, basically during Stalin's time, he forced uh, centralized food production on the people of Russia and the Ukraine and a number of other countries that Russia had managed to dominate at that time. And, uh, you know, they basically, you know, just, you know, Stalin uh, basically to create collective agriculture, uh, basically starved and destroyed and murdered the small farmers of that part of the world. Anybody that put up any resistance to the collectivization of agriculture was done in. They lost about nine million people in a Holocaust event in Ukraine that nobody even knows anything about. We hear about the Holocaust of World War II. Well, the Holdemar and the Ukraine happened 10 years before World War II and before those things happened. And Stalin didn't put people in concentration camps. He starved people in place. And uh, so, so, uh, so people, you know, in, in, for, to create a collectivized, centralized food production system, it was basically a failure from the start that couldn't feed the people and eventually left deserts in its wake. Well, what happened when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, 1992? You know, that collectivized agriculture, the Russian people didn't trust that to feed them already. You know, the stores were already empty. Um, so what, did, what happened? People, um, people started growing gardens for themselves. They, they had not just gardens around their houses and the places they lived, but they also had forest gardens in the forest lands where they would forage for mushrooms. And I've been in those forest gardens in the Ukraine, and they contain walnuts, hazelnuts, elderberries, uh, Cornelian cherries, all kinds, el you know, all kinds of edible plants. So, so they would feed themselves from their woodland uh, spaces and woodland gardens as well. And so when the Soviet Union collapsed overnight in 1992, not that long ago, major world power, the people in the Soviet Union were on the verge of famine. And what saved them? Home gardens. It wasn't agriculture that saved the people of the Soviet Union from starvation in large numbers. It was their home gardens. They knew enough to be prepared because they were already food insecure, being dependent upon large-scale centralized and collective agriculture. So they began to grow food for themselves. I've been to the Ukraine and seen those, some of those gardens, and they garden right up to the foundation of the house. I was there in the wintertime, and they had it all prepped and ready to go for the next season crop, right up to the foundation. There wasn't a nice little uh, foundation planting of boxwoods and junipers and hollies, little round balls around their houses. You know, they couldn't spare the space for that. They needed to be growing food to make sure that they could get through whatever was coming. So let's bring it back to America, Detroit. Detroit, over the last six months, has been in the news a lot. You know, if you listen to the corporate media, it sounds like Detroit is a big failure and a failed economy, and they can't even manage their affairs and things like that. Well, basically, Detroit is a place where the Industrial Revolution came and went, where the people were left behind 
when the industries left. There are all kinds of Rust Belt cities all over the place where this has happened. So in post-industrial uh, Detroit, um, you know, the economy was in bad shape. The people, that, the crime levels were going through the roof. Uh, whole neighborhoods were abandoned or razed. But what was left after that? You know, all those spaces between those buildings. And guess what? That looks like food producing land. So the people of uh, Detroit, particularly in the African American community, began to, to garden. And there was a group of African Americans called the Garden Angels who had grown up in the South and had learned to grow food from their parents and their grandparents. And they knew what that meant, you know, to, to be able to do that. They came and they started teaching their fellow citizens how to garden and grow food. And so today, the story of Detroit is actually, from my perspective, kind of miraculous. It's not a disaster, but it's actually, uh, you know, a sign of hope because, um, what happened was that now, you know, with that gardening revolution that took place there, uh, there are 1,200 community gardens in Detroit alone. 1,200 community gardens. There are probably seven to 8,000 abandoned lot, you know, private gardens that are there. Maybe more than that at this point. Um, and then there are also cooking and nutrition classes going on because what you know, the, the experience in inner city community gardens has been that people have lost the skills to prepare the foods that you can grow in a garden. You know, they microwave or buy frozen food or pizzas or takeout or whatever it might be. So, so they realized pretty early on they had to also start teaching cooking classes and nutrition classes and really teaching people how to take advantage of these nutritious foods. So, so the story in Detroit is that they're, they're actually turning into pioneers. They are actually the ones, in my opinion, who are really doing a lot of the pioneering of the neo-horticultural revival. This is what I call this re revival of horticultural societies in garden-based culture. That's kind of my name for it. So uh, they're doing amazing things. They're going food. Uh, they're you know, training children in how to grow food. They're doing it together, so they're building community while they grow food together. And uh, it's just, you know, a rather amazing resurgence. And, and what happens when that happens is those, those communities that were down and out are now starting to have pride in their communities again. And they're learning to be interdependent. And they're recognizing that they are dependent upon each other for their well-being. And so that builds collective activity and it for the benefit of the whole when that happens. Uh, they're reclaiming space for growing food and growing food in places where there's no soil. Uh, as you see, you know, in this, this right picture, they're growing food in, on an old parking lot. In the left picture, you know, between a couple of buildings, you know, where there wasn't much going on. So they're taking and reclaiming unused spaces, you know, and, and producing food in, in huge, huge quantities to feed themselves. So where does the future lie? You know, I'm a little prejudiced on this, but I really believe that, it, that the future is really for gardeners and garden culture. And I think that actually big agriculture is, uh, is on its way out. It's too fragile. The supply chain is too long in many cases. And uh, the inability to deal with, in a monocultural agricultural system to deal with climate shifts or failed uh, situations like that is, 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 is quite a problem. This lower right-hand picture is Lake Baikal in Russia, where all the water was pumped out and away and left this uh, dry lake bed, which had one time been a huge lake, probably as big as the state of North Carolina. So gardens trump big agriculture, in, in my opinion. You know, let's look at some numbers to show you why I believe this. One calorie in, in a garden, yields 40 calories in food energy. In other words, your cal caloric input of, of planting crops, hoeing them, mulching them, things like that, is gonna give you or 40 times the return on your energy investment. In industrial agriculture, that food you buy in the grocery store, or the natural food store, or wherever, 
that uh, because there's industrial agriculture in organics too. Uh, it's four to 12 calories in to one calorie of food out. I don't think that's gonna be sustainable for that long. I really don't. Uh, food travels feet or even inches from garden to table or garden to kitchen. It travels miles. The average food in America travels 1,200 miles from farm to plate. So uh, that doesn't, and that's where a lot of that in the transportation uh, and processing is where a lot of those calories that make that equation not work so well and for industrial agriculture come in is the transport miles that are involved. Uh, gardens are highly productive and efficient. Uh, agricultural production has substituted fossil fuels for efficiency. It may seem to be efficient, labor saving, but when you start really running the numbers on energy in, energy out, it's not very efficient. Uh, minimal external inputs in a garden. You can grow your fertility for your garden once you get it established. You might need some inputs in establishment, but then after that, you shouldn't need very many inputs at all. Whereas in a in monoculture, annual crop production, agriculture, continual inputs, pesticides, fertilizers, on and on and on and on and on. Um, um, and so, you know, I don't need to go down this whole list. I think you get the point. Um, you know, it makes a whole lot of sense in many cases. Uh, I'll just mention nutrition uh, briefly before we move on. And that is, you know, nutrition in vegetables fades rapidly depending after it's been picked. So anybody ever had the experience of buying uh, some uh, kale in the natural food store you bring it home, stick it in your refrigerator, and the next day it's starting to turn yellow? That's because that food's 10 or 12 days old before you even buy it, before it even shows up on the, on the store shelf in many cases. So it's got limited stuff, and the nutritional value is just not there anymore, as opposed to a kale that was growing in your garden or in your coal frame that you can just go out and pick and harvest, and you get the full complement of nutrients that way. So. Um, if big agriculture, and I, and I want to make this clear as I'm talking about big agriculture, is, is, is not really such a good idea. And I could have spent the whole time elaborating on, on this whole big agriculture as a failed experiment. Let's move it on to more positive things, though. But, uh, you know, if we look at, at agriculture as this thing is not working so well that it actually creates a lot of risk, and if you start looking at what's happening in the food systems in our country, has anybody noticed that food prices have gone up maybe 20% in the last few years? Uh, they're gonna go up even more now that California is, is you know, and all the production is, is drying up in California. Uh, food prices are expected to skyrocket even more. Um, so let's look for some other solutions. Um, this, is a, this is a wonderful aerial photograph of of Geneva, Switzerland, and I think we can, we can learn a lot from the Swiss. You know, that's a little small landlocked country, you know, always at risk of being cut off from its supply chains from, you know, conflict in Europe and things like that. And if you look at these neighborhoods in Geneva, what do we see? We see a lot of food going on. Vegetable gardens in every backyard, uh, fruit trees uh, planted around the houses. So. You just is the same way in the story of the Ukraine. Uh, when people have seen over time and historically what can happen, they learn to adapt uh, security strategies that are gonna work for them. America's never really had the, to deal with the kind of devastation in, in our recent memory that, is, you know, that's, that Europeans have hold in their memory bank. And so um, maybe we, don't, we haven't been brought as close to the the door uh, of starvation is, is it may take, and hopefully we'll be able to avoid that and make some course corrections to get us there before we have to, have to be forced into gardening for ourselves. So this, this could actually be a great thing, this uh, process of restoring food and abundance to our world and creating a neo-horticultural or a gardening-based way of life for ourselves and our communities. This could be 
not only beautiful, this is a, this is a design that an Austrian permaculturalist uh, uh, designed and installed, a man named Sepp Holzer. You'll hear a little bit more about him later on. Uh, on a fairly steep hillside, carving out and, and, and complexing water pathways and aquaculture systems mixed with, with gardens and, and pastures and animal systems all working together in this really amazing whole to accomplish uh, you know, phenomenal amounts of productivity. And also, one of the things that I, I don't want to do is make this just be a utilitarian argument. You know, f let's, let's do this in a beautiful way so that we feed our souls as well as our bellies. And, uh, and if we can create gardens that are really beautiful and attractive, then we've got to lure ourselves out of the house these days. You know, I mean, we've become an indoor culture. We move from one hermetically sealed container to another uh, over the course of our working days. And, and you know, we, we think that when it rains, it's bad. Oh, bad weather coming, it's going to rain. You know, and, well, why are we too worried about that when we're moving from our carport to our, you know, uh, you know parking building and going into the building and stuff. So, so we, can, we, need a, we need to actually, as gardeners, create gardens and landscapes that are so magically beautiful that people can't stay out of them, that they want one for themselves. Um, Charlie Heddington, one of my early permaculture students in Greensboro, North Carolina, converted his whole front yard. He just mulched his lawn out of existence and planted it into a, a beautiful garden of uh, herbs and you know, flowers and food plants. He took that little strip between the sidewalk and the curb and planted it into the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. And, and that was back in, uh, oh, probably... 2000, no, it was earlier than that, maybe 96 or something like that. Uh, you go into that neighborhood today and there's probably something over 40 yards that have got gardens in the front yard. You know, Charlie and his wife would find people that would be jogging by, lived in downtown Greensboro, be jogging by, and they'd be so taken with the garden that they'd end up wandering around in it, you know, and, you know, just all those kind of things. So the power of a good example, a good converted front yard can be amazingly powerful. We can learn from intact uh, horticultural and village cultures around the world. I've, been, I've mentioned uh, Europe and, and uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, Japan has, you know, some really wonderful, beautiful uh, village cultures that are still intact in Japan. Africa has intact village cultures. South America, Central America, you know, they're to be found all over the world. And what we need to be doing is, is going there, discovering that village wisdom and bringing it back. You know, a lot of times we think, oh, there's poor people out there. Let's go give them some aid. Well, it, well I'm starting to realize, you know, because I've been spending some time in the two-thirds world, I start looking back at America and saying, oh, there's poor people in America. Can't we get some two-thirds uh, world people to come here and, and teach us what we need to learn about how to value community, you know, and how to value, you know, our time and, and the way we spend our lives in whole different ways. I think we have more to learn from the two-thirds world in many cases than they have to learn from us. Uh, so if we're going to do this work, how are we going to do it? You know, I think these are about six of the primary things that we need to be looking at. Food is, is an easy win, always. Uh, everybody agrees that, you know, with growing more food and more local food, it cuts across political and ideological boundaries. Food unites us all. We do it three to five to seven times a day. Um, so I think using, the, using food and food activism to actually unite a really divided culture can be really a powerful thing. And once again, this is how we as gardeners can heal the divides that separate us from each other. Uh, shelter, obviously another important piece. Um, uh, my wife Marjorie is, is in the audience here, and, and she, was, she does a lot of uh, public health work in, in Rutherford, Polk, and McDowell counties. And she was telling me that in McDowell County, uh, and that's a county of maybe 40, 45,000 people in the whole county. 
uh, she was talking to some people in the school system, and they, says, they, they said there are, are 1,500 homeless children in McDowell County, in a county with a population of a little over 40,000 people. That means that shelter is not readily available as a human right to us in this world. And we can do something about that. We can restore communities to health. And one of the ways that I think we do that is we help each other out. Uh, we need to, you know, for the last, I don't know, for maybe most of America's history, we have prided ourselves on our independence. Well, that's taken us a good ways, but it's not going to take us to the finish line, I'm afraid, because it means that we nucleate and we don't learn to cooperate and all these connections that need to happen don't happen if we're all separated from each other. So the more important value, in my opinion, from an ecological perspective is interdependence. We need to engage in activities that make conscience our dependence on each other. And so uh, that's the way we'll build community is when we, when we consciously learn to cultivate interdependence. And then energy. Uh, and health and livelihood, all of those kind of things, we can't ignore economics. Um, but I'll, but I'll, I'll, I will say this, is that around economics, I did a talk a few years back called Backyard Economics, and I looked at uh, you know, the productivity of backyard gardens and things along those kind of lines, and community gardens, and the return on investment. And you know, if the word ever got out that, that than investment in a blueberry bush or a collard plant or a basil plant will give you a far greater return on investment than that niggling little 1% that you can get on your, on your CDs or, or uh, you know, on, on, on any kind of, you know, investments like that are huge. You know, it outstrips it beyond compare. So if Wall Street ever found out that they're actually a bad investment, if we could convince everybody that's a bad investment and get people invest in blueberries and apple trees and, and collards and things like that, you know, it might, be, it might make a huge difference. <clears throat> so there's a wonderful Chilean economist named Manfred Max Neef. And he and some of his graduate students started doing some research back in the uh, 70s on what are the primary and fundamental human needs. Uh, and they came up with a list of nine of them. And these, these are, I think, really powerful. Notice that the first two, subsistence, that's food, shelter, the ability to earn a livelihood, and things like that is important. For sure it is. And protection. That's what houses provide for us. It's what gathering together provides for us, protection from those things that might threaten us on many levels. It's what family uh, cultivates is protection as well. Uh, those become very important. But those, those physical things that, that I've been pretty much talking about here for the last little while are only two of our primary fundamental human needs. We could need to be able to create cultures that also pre create places and spaces where these other human needs, affection, understanding, participation, leisure time, creativity, a, a sense of personal identity and contribution in the world, and the freedom to think and act for ourselves in many ways are also met as well by our society. And so those are some of the things that we try to look at in permaculture is how do we, how do, we do that? Uh, permaculture, I haven't really focused on permaculture too much here, but it's an ecological design system for the creation of regenerative and restorative human habitats. So it's more than just a good gardening system. It's more than just a good landscape uh, strategy or practice. It has to do with uh, actually how do we transform human society to be able to sustain us so that we can actually leave a legacy to future generations and those that come after us of health and abundance and a positive future for this beautiful garden planet we inhabit. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from ancient cultures. Uh, this was a culture that I grew in a bottle that I forgot to cap. And uh, that's fungus growing in there. And, you know, taking the nutrients that are available, there's things that we can learn here. If you look at, look at how fungi 
send in their mycelial networks combine and then let fruiting bodies come up. You know, I can see how this could look a little bit like a map of Western North Carolina with here's Asheville and here's Hendersonville and here's Waynesville and here's all these little small towns and here's all these rural communities. And if we could think about how we can organize ourselves into networks that support and feed off each other, that where we actually can take the innovations of one community and apply them in another community so that the lessons get shared. What we learn in Hendersonville, we can apply in, uh, in Rutherfordton and on and on and on. There's really huge potential to do amazing things. And, you know, we might model our future culture and society on fungi. They're pretty darn successful. Um, I wanted to give you a little quickie Michael Pollan uh, quote here. Uh, gar the garden suggests there might be a place where we can meet nature halfway. Uh, how many people here have heard of na nature deficit disorder? Yeah, it's become a really uh, big topic. I first heard about it on NPR about four or five years ago when a, a man named uh, Richard Louve, L-O-U-V-E, uh, wrote a book called The Last Child Left in the Woods. And it was about the effects that separation from nature was having on uh, the children of America. And he coined a term, nature deficit disorder, to describe that separation and what the effects of that were on the individuals, uh, individual children, as well as our larger society. When we disconnect from nature, we don't think we need it, we can abuse it, treat it poorly, whatever. So uh, we need to recognize that our nourishment in many ways and forms in the, in, comes from reconnecting with nature. And that's what gardens, if anything, are most excellent at doing. <coughs> Excuse me. So what's going on elsewhere? Let's take a quick look at what some people are doing in various other places and some strategies that I personally find to be quite inspiring. Um, and the, the choices that I made, because I'm a little uh, biased towards permaculture, are, are, uh, are movements that were actually informed by permaculture in, in uh, their inception and how they were carried, carried out. Um, Toby Hemingway, who wrote one of the, most, the world's most popular permaculture books called Gaia's Garden, which is a guide to essentially home-scale permaculture for temperate climates. A really excellent book. If you haven't seen it or it's not in your library, I'd really highly recommend it. Uh, he's actually the one that put me onto this whole thing about horticultural societies in the first place. And he pointed out that actually permaculture is, in many ways, uh, a design system for designing a horticultural way of life. And this is, and you know, he's. What Toby said was permaculture can be more than just a tool of sustainability. The horticultural way of life that it embraces may offer the road to human freedom, health, and a just society where people's needs are met in, in good ways. So these things are all informed by permaculture at one level or another. And if you'd like to find out more about permaculture, there's generally uh, quite a few permaculture courses that go on in this region. Uh, mostly centered around Asheville at this point. Uh, some take place out at Earth Haven Eco Village where I live as well. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really been an amazing movement that's really just now coming into its own. Uh, but incredible edible Todd Morden. Todd Morden is a town in, uh, in central England. It's a market town not too far from Manchester. It's another, it's a little smaller than Detroit. It's about 19, 20,000 people now. It's another place where the Industrial Revolution came and went. And, uh, and this is a place where three garden activists sitting around the kitchen table looking at the global food situation said, what can we do about that? And they asked themselves a question. What would it take for Todd Morden to become food self-reliant as a community? Because community food self-reliance is possible. Individual or family food self-reliance would consume all of your time. 
So we really need to do this on a community scale as opposed to just an individual scale. Is what, will, what would it look like if in 10 years, and they started this in 2008, and they said, what would it look like if our little town could be food self-reliant in 18, you know, in 10 years? And so they went about making that happen. And the first thing they did was to plant a guerrilla garden. They went in on an abandoned piece of property, didn't ask anybody in for their permission, and just started gardening on this landscape. And it was an old uh, health center. And then they went and found more public land that wasn't being used, waste places, and started cultivating those waste places. And so this picture that you see before you are beds that are in front of the uh, Todd Morton Police Department. You know, they're growing corn, beans, and squash, and all kinds of leafy vegetables, and a few flowers, and who all knows what else, and those raised beds right on the main street of that town. And so basically they started doing workshops, they started working with uh, school gardens, they started developing Google Maps of all the, the existing fruit trees in the town, and all the existing gardens, and all the existing backyard chickens, and all the existing uh, you know, bees uh, and beehives and things like that. And so they created these food maps of Todd Morden so that people could see where they could get their ex ex extra eggs if they needed them and things like that. And they started organizing the community on a very informal way. They didn't create an organization. They just went out as activists and started doing the work. Because organization building takes a lot of time and energy, and then you get yourself dependent upon grants and stuff like this. This is a totally volunteer operation. And so today, um, you know, there's free food to be had all over Todd Morton. There's gardens everywhere. They planted over 900 fruit trees throughout the town. Uh, and, you know, and they've also attracted farmers and, and, and started getting local farmers to contract to, to supply the community's needs. They calculated how many eggs Todd Morden, the Todd Morden uh, community ate in a week, and they started making plans on how are we gonna grow that, you know, how are we gonna get that many eggs so that we don't have to start be importing them from industrial egg operations and things like that. How can we support local farmers and local enterprises? And there were three plates to this. One was community, one was food, and one was economy. They started working with the local uh, green grocers and people like that to get them to carry local food. They did, they did numerous other things as well. They've got a wonderful website that I'd really invite you to visit. And, uh, and this is uh, just them doing some gardens. You, they do a lot of these activities together, so it's become you know, a very social thing. They, they started getting some attention and people started coming there to see what they were doing. And they realized that they had a tourism opportunity. And so they set up a walking trail around Toddmore and a food trail that goes past the local pubs and stores and things like that, which increase the local uh, mer merchants' uh, economic bottom lines just from the tourism that started happening. They started training other people. Now there's about 200 incredible edible, you know, towns and cities uh, that are practicing some of this around the world, all over, on every continent now. So amazing, don't ever underestimate what a few committed and wild and crazy uh, community activists can accomplish, you know, around a kitchen table. Um, growing power. This is Will Allen. He's the man that started this. He t Will um, was a professional basketball player and he was from, uh, from Milwaukee. He went back and looked into his community and he saw huge levels of poverty, unemployed youth, crime because those youth didn't have anything to do. And he went in and took, got some abandoned land that had a couple of old glass houses on it and started uh, converting those glass houses into aquaponics, meaning growing fish and vegetables, growing vegetables on the wastewater uh, of the fish and uh, started really permaculturing out those acres. And now, you know, those two or three urban acres there are earning over $100,000 an acre in returns on food that's being grown intensively in the city. And it's not just about growing the food, it's also about training the, the, the inner city farmers and giving those inner city youth opportunities to, to do something with their lives other than, you know, be 
uh, you know, drift, drifting, you know. And so it's, been, it's made a huge difference. And he's, he's rock star great at this point. Um, the growing power movement spread, and many places are starting to adapt that as well. So that's a wonderful example. Um, lots to be found out about, about what they're doing there. In Columbia, South Carolina, some people were, were inspired by growing power, and they set in downtown uh, Columbia in an urban farm there, they set up one of those aquaponics, uh, growing power style, style aquaponics system in a greenhouse here, and so you can go see one. Uh, school kids from all over the Columbia uh, area, and, and uh, when, I forget what that county that Columbia is in, in South Carolina, but uh, you know they're bringing school kids in by the bus loads. They're mo making more money on the school kids than they are on the vegetables they're selling out of there. You know, five dollars a head to tour around and see what's possible. So, um, I'm not a big fan of lawns. Most of my battles with my father as a young man were over mowing the lawn. Uh, I did everything I could to avoid it, and we had huge fights about it for years and years and years because there's some part of me that just felt like mowing lawns was a huge waste of time. Uh, it turns out it is. Um, in America, there are 35 million acres of lawns, and, and most of those lawns or sinks for agricultural chemicals and pesticides and fertilizers. You know, they're toxic food, you know, they're toxic deserts in many ways, those lawns are. They consume huge amounts of fossil fuel energy to keep them mowed and maintained over time. It's a net energy loss of the, or the worst order in many ways. So what if we took that 35 million acres and, and converted it into, uh, into food production. Well, if we just took 10% of the American lawns and converted them to food production, you know, home gardens, things along those kind of lines, then we could, in uh, the suburbs and, and urban areas of America, produce a third of our produce. You know, if it, it, we may be, this may be what it comes down to if, you know, if California agriculture really fails as badly as a lot of people are predicting, because that's where most of our fresh produce comes from in this country right now. So we may be back to our backyards before we know it. There, there are three times as many acres and lawn in America as there are, are growing corn. Now, I don't like the way they're growing corn here, but to just give you a little sense of the scale of, of lawns, um, and what happens? Well, by golly, those restless youth, those, those uh, you know, ones that just, you know, you know, get, you know, crazy ideas, it started something called Grow Food, Not Lawns. And this is, a, you can find it on Facebook. They've got a Facebook page. They've got a highly decentralized, no central organization that's basically advocating for and uh, promoting uh, eliminating lawns and, and, and growing food. You know, here's an example, you know, that, I, that they put this, this uh, together on their Facebook page. I just love this, this illustration of the stages of lawn elimination. It's what I call getting rid of lawn order. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, a really important movement and one that we can find out a lot about. There's actually a book called Grow Food, Not Lawns. Uh, now that has lots of handy, you know, gardening strategies and techniques. Uh, in Sydney, Australia, or Melbourne, pardon me, Australia, a bunch of permaculturalists got together there and said, how can we get more urban uh, backyards into food production? And, and they came up with this amazing concept called permablitz. And what that involves is uh, bringing in uh, a team of novice permaculture designers under the supervision of an experienced permaculture designer into a backyard, into a client's back or front yard, and doing a relatively simple redesign of that yard to optimize food production in that space, and then uh, and then having uh, a day in which which people come from you know all over the place uh, to actually do. The install, so it becomes a giant garden party in which 30, 40 people sometimes will go in uh, with all the, it's highly organized 
and within a day you can convert a backyard into uh, a, a fully you know developed and ready to plant landscape so you know this is this is what they look like and it's quite organized they've got handbooks that you can download online if you're interested in doing it yourself they're open source so you can modify them they've got one for the designer a, a handbook they've got one for the the person whose yard's going to get done they get one, there's one for the the manager of the day of the perma blitz and and one more as well so they've got a lot of open source software on how to organize these events and they're great fun it's kind of like crop mob for backyards instead of uh, people going out from the city to support the farmers this is city people cooperating and then you move you know maybe your backyard will be next month and and then another backyard the next month so it's building this functional interdependence and those people that help these folks you know build this garden in a day have got buy-in to those folks success so they've got support from the larger community this way it's a phenomenal concept for converting uh, suburbia into you know high, highly productive spaces uh, I wanted to just mention too that that we need to recognize that this whole food security issue we need to be in solidarity with the people in the two-thirds world who often are the ones that suffer uh, the most at the hands of big agriculture and so uh, looking at some of these organizations that are that are striking out for for peasants uh, rights and they're often very much involved in in uh, food you know small-scale food growing and stuff becomes really important so we can't ignore the effects that uh, our our food consuming habits have on people in places that we don't can't even conceptualize what happens when uh, when Chiquita banana comes in and you know and, and takes over your landscape uh, you know the landscape that's been used in or held in commons to provide for your needs for long periods of time those kind of things happen out there folks but let's look at a few liberation technologies uh, I call them liberation technologies because in many ways these are these are simple technologies or strategies or gardening approaches that actually can liberate us and free us from uh, having to spend as much of our lives chasing after the dollar to pay our bills or to pay our electric bills or cook our food or one thing or another like this this is a solar cooker made out of uh, a pattern uh, that you can get off the internet. It's called, uh, 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 what is that pattern called? I think it's a solar uh, parabola cooker or something like that. And it's basically a piece of cardboard that you take some Elmer's glue and glue some aluminum foil on. You cut it out, you lift it up, fold it into that form so that it becomes an inexpensive parabolic collector that focuses uh, sunlight on that uh, cooking container in the middle. and. Uh, you know, so you can you can set that up in the morning on a nice sunny day, and uh, put your rice and beans in there, and come back, and your supper's ready for you when you get home, uh, with no fossil fuel inputs whatsoever. You know, and it's it's amazing how simple it can be. We can take and repurpose uh, unused materials, uh, and in this situation, take an old pallets lay it on a side on an old gravel parking lot fill it full of soil and plant it up you know you might have less less uh, weeds in a system like that than you might have you know in a regular garden that you till every year you know because where are the weeds going to grow uh, I think you're going to you know I think they're going to do pretty well so I love old pallets I think they've got all kinds of possibilities uh, here's what I did in my uh, my yard in front of my house uh, or our house last year I took two pallets stood them on end if you measure the square footage on a pallet standing on end it's about two square feet if you stand it on end you suddenly have uh, 32 square feet of growing space and two speed of horizontal two square feet of horizontal surface area uh, that's because you've got a four by you know most pallets are four by four four by four times four is 16 you got the front and the back sides so that's 32 square feet of potential growing space 
and we need to learn to use vertical spaces uh, to be able to grow in. And I was just playing around and experimenting with that. I planted corn in it, I planted beans in it, I planted strawberries in it, uh, planted some flowers in it so that my neighbors wouldn't complain too much. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I planted stevia, different things like that, just trying stuff out to see what it'd do. And uh, it was amazing, you know, to, you know, how, you know, how the potential that could be realized from the application of that concept, even into particularly in urban environments where space is often limited. And this is a uh, basically taking a bunch of waste materials, old pallets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and creating wildlife habitat because <coughs> and pollinator habitat, beneficial insect habitat, <coughs> excuse me, to uh, be able to create those places for those, those uh, members of the insect kingdom that our lives are so dependent on for the food that we eat. We need to create space for something besides humanity in this bigger picture uh, because we're going to need all the help that we can get along those lines. And those, those uh, orchard mason bees are our friends. And all we have to do in many cases is set up the habitat for them and they'll take it from there. You know, um, so they'll pollinate our plants. I'll eat the pests that grow on our plants, many things like that. So it's just about setting up those kind of habitats. Uh, this is a, a woven uh, willow fence. And, uh, you know, before the Iron Age, or really the Steel Age, uh, all fences in the world were living fences or biological fences. And uh, there's, a, there's a revival going on right now of uh, doing living and woven, woven fences. I, and uh, this is just an example of that. This is where you can take uh, stump sprouts or uh, willow rods or whatever and weave together fences that are much more pleasing and aesthetic and beautiful and, and uh, less costly and, than anything you could uh, find at Lowe's or Home Depot's. I don't think they're going to be selling these at Lowe's or Home Depot's anytime soon. However, some of these can be quite beautiful. I think you could start a whole garden fad around this. I think there's livelihoods to be made in living in, in uh, woven fence building for, for, uh, you know, for, you know, for our properties. This is an example of uh, some woven live fencing made out of living willow rods. You basically, willow is pretty easy to root. You just stick a stick about this time of year, you stick a willow branch in the ground and it roots and it starts growing. And uh, then you just start pruning it and weaving it and managing it. And before you know, you've got these amazingly beautiful uh, fencing systems to, to keep the stuff out that you want to keep out and let the stuff in that wants to come in. I mentioned Sepp Holzer a little bit earlier. And he's an, uh, he's an Austrian uh, gentleman that, that uh, developed or, or actually popularized, he didn't just develop it, he popularized it and modified a really interesting garden bed strategy called Hugel culture, which is German for hill culture, in which you basically dig out a trench where you want your garden bed to be, you take and throw waste woody materials, that means logs, branches from uh, you know, cleaning up your property or maybe some trees that you had to cut down or maybe you get them from, uh, you know, a, a local arborist or whatever and you just pile them up, throw, throw the dirt back on top of it um, and then maybe a, a humus layer over the top of that and you've got this, this uh, garden bed that actually captures and concentrates carbon and nutrients and, and as those woody materials break down it creates this moisture holding environment so it, the, these gardens are drought proof and um, they and the humus is captured so that as it as it decays and turns from and breaks down it's not uh, you know gassed off into the air as carbon dioxide nearly as much so it captures carbon in the environment it's drought proof and once again it takes takes advantage of that kind of vertical uh, situation so that you've got a bed that might be four feet wide but it's actually got a growing space that might be you know eight to eight to twelve feet 
wide. So, and, and here's an example of one. There, you know, you don't have to do them that steeply. There's no one right or wrong way. I'm just trying to give you a few ideas that you can take home and apply uh, in your own home landscapes. And then uh, this one I really like too. This was a, this is a framed hugel culture in which, you know, some old pallets got knocked apart and converted into, uh, you know, a hugel culture garden in which, you'd, you know, you'd put the logs and everything in the middle, throw the soil on top, and then just start putting, uh, plant, putting your vegetable, plugging your vegetable transplants into the side of it, and away you go. Almost no cost involved in this kind of gardening system. Um, I wanted to just mention this as well, and, and this is one thing that I think has a lot of potential uh, for us in, uh, in, in crafting neo-horticultural uh, gardening strategies, and that's coppice as, as, a, as a production system. Uh, coppice is basically starting a plant and, and then cutting it off and letting it base sprout from the base. And we've all seen that happen around maple trees. You cut a maple tree down in the wintertime, you know, spring comes by June, you've got 20, 30 sprouts coming up from the base. That's essentially what you're doing. It turns out that that material down near the ground where that seed started off is juvenile material. And the material at the top of a plant is mature uh, um, you know, genetic material or cells that are down there. So if you want to reinvigorate and rejuvenalize a plant, maybe the best strategy might be to cut it down and then let it grow back. Um, you know, there are coppice woodlands in England that are over a thousand years old, stumps that have been continuously harvested for materials for building fences, for firewood and fuel wood, um, you know, for, you know, food production as well. Nut trees, hazelnuts are often coppiced. And that basically gives plants essentially eternal life when you're able to do that. So um, this is an ancient uh, English chestnut orchard in which you're managing using coppice. So rather than having trees that get really tall, spread out really far, um, you know, and you can only space maybe 30 of them into an acre of land, this way you can plant them much closer together in a, in a row culture that you, that you can periodically prune to maintain uh, new growth coming up from the base of it. And uh, using this method, the Chinese grow their chestnuts this way too. And uh, if, you, if you do it conventionally, like a conventional chestnut orchard with full-size chestnut trees, you're going to get maybe 2,000 pounds of chestnuts per acre per year. If you do use this coppice method, you can get 8,000 pounds of chestnuts per acre per year by just adopting a different horticultural strategy and way of managing those plants. In the same space, you can quadruple your production in that kind of situation. And these are just a few of the examples of, uh, of ways that you can do that. So I'd like to wrap it up uh, with, you know, what I believe is the case is that, that humans, while it often appears that our presence on the planet is destructive and not positive at all, I think that we can turn that one around. I think that, that there are enough examples in, among traditional societies that have occupied landscapes for long periods of time without degrading or exhausting uh, those landscapes that we can learn to do the same thing. And our human presence can be one that actually restores abundance to the world as opposed to one that depletes it. That we can actually, through our presence as gardeners and horticulturalists and land caretakers, we can actually restore abundance to the landscapes in our care and provide a legacy for future generations. So humans do have a place here. We do have a creative role to play. We can love this world back to life. And the plant communities and the gardening traditions of the world are our allies in being able to do that. We just need to ally with plants and animals and biological systems and learn to think in, from an ecosystem's perspective. And we can set to right 
uh, what, is, what has often uh, been ripped asunder by the ac activities of our fellow members of our species. So I think that we can do this, but it's gonna take you know, a commitment on our time. Um, Bill Reed, who's a, a pretty famous architect, he, was, he helped write the LEED standards for energy efficient buildings and things like that. A few years back, he hooked up with some, uh, some crazy permaculturalists in, in uh, New Mexico and uh, set up a, a, a business called Regenerative Design. And uh, I, I saw a, a talk he did one time in which he said that what their experience was is that once they went to work on ecosystems re restoration, uh, often based on permaculture strategies and approaches, it took about 18 months for those, those ecosystems to really you know, come back, for the waters to return to the creeks and the streams and for the biodiversity to return and for the seeds that had maybe been just waiting for the right opportunity to sprout and grow. So we found out that you know, 18 months to start for ecosystems to be well on the way to repair. So he uh, postulated that, that basically given all the environmental challenges that we face today, if we as a humanity could devote 18 months of our collective time to the restoration of, of our environments to health, diversity, and abundance, that we could actually put the world to right in 18 months of dedicated effort. And I believe him. I think we can do that. And, you know, and I personally, you know, can play a small part in that. But, you know, if we each, you know, can engage others in this work, uh, you know, I think we can pull it off. You know, I'm not, not uh, a cynic at all about humanity's possibilities. I try to be a realist. But I also recognize that if we partner with the natural world, if we partner with those people of like mind and heart, that there's no end to the good that we can do in this world. Thanks, y'all. So I wanted to leave a couple of minutes for questions. Is any, is this, yes. Okay, well, food insecurity in the case of that Gallup poll was based on telephone interviews in which they would call people up and ask them, Are you, do you feel secure about your ability to feed your family or to, to have food on the table you know, on a regular basis or not? If people answered yes to that question, then uh, you know, that was an indicator of food insecurity. It's when people aren't secure in their ability to be able to be able to feed themselves or their families. That's food insecurity. So, um, so the people who were, were polled or surveyed mm -hmm. uh, were not thinking in terms of the availability in the grocery stores for them, or were they thinking in terms of independent security? Well, it wasn't that they couldn't go to the grocery store and buy food if they could afford to. It's about the economic capacity to be able to buy food. You know, in the famines of the world, you know, there, were, there, was, there was food available. It was all about, could you afford to buy it or not if you were a city dweller? So it's about, it's not that there's, you know, the wealthy could afford to feed themselves. It was the people that were, you know, at the bottom of the economic totem pole that were challenged in their ability to eat. So, yes, ma'am. Because they did, you know, it was, a sur it was surveys. I mean, that Gallup did on that, and it turned out that there were more people that felt insecure in North Carolina, you know. And these are not people that you see, you know. They're not out there in public. They may not be in most of the places that you and I go, but they're there. And I'll tell you the place to go and see in food insecure people is to go to the grocery store. You know, Ingalls, great place to watch food ins insecurity in, in, in place and look at what people are having to buy and looking at how many people are needing to, to get, um, you know, food stamps to help be able to feed their families to make in, ends meet.
you know, it's pretty apparent. And what are their choices? You know, this is, this is where education becomes so important because, you know, what happened that we became a people that, that when we got hungry didn't even think the default position wasn't to go out to the garden and get something to eat? That was, that's not even, you know, in many food insecure people, something that crosses their mind or they'd be doing something about it, I imagine. Not, it's, it's a bigger issue than that. Um, yes, these, are, these soils in Western North Carolina are some of the oldest in the world. Um, they're some of the most mineral depleted in the world too because they've gone, in, temp, in temperate climates where you've got lots of high rainfall, that really pulls the nutrients out of the soil pretty rapidly. So we have high rainfall, and so, you know, so these soils are pretty depleted. If you look at phosphorus levels, I, I read a lot of soil tests, and I see phosphorus indexes down in the, the four to, to five, five range a lot of times, and healthy phosphorus levels is somewhere in the, in the range on that index of uh, 50 to 60. And we've got soils that are so poor in phosphorus that they're down there. Uh, that means a lot of stuff is not going to grow very well at all in those kind of situations. You're absolutely right in that way. Um, you know. Um, well, I think there's a number of ways to rectify it. I would advocate remineralization as hard and fast as we can go. And that means going, and, and the cheapest way to remineralize soil around here is to go to the gravel quarries. And, and get those screenings, those fines when they're when they're when they're uh, washing gravel to go on, you know, gravel roads and things like that. They wash the small particles out of there. You take that. That's granite dust, basically. You put that back on the soil. It's going to be high in, in uh, potash. It's also got, you know, maybe 70, 80 different other uh, micronutrients and you know, and and plant minerals that are there. Remineralizing the soil is, you know, they say that. It, uh, there's some people that have said that remineralizing the soil can reverse uh, climate change just by remineralizing our soils because that gives plants the ability to capture more carbon from the atmosphere to grow faster and better and healthier. So they put on more biomass, which pulls that carbon out of the air and sequesters it back into living forms or, or humates and things like that. So I think remineralization is the way to go. Um, you know, nature is doing is trying to take care of this problem for us. You leave you leave land untended in western North Carolina, and what happens? The forest returns. You know, and the soil starts to build again. I don't think we've got thousands of years to build inches of topsoil, but we can build topsoil way faster than that with with certain cultivation methods like uh, deep bed soil cultivation and you know, things along those kind of lines. So I call it deep bed soil uh, building. It's basically, you know, restoring, building, tilling deeply with actual machines. Machines can be our friends. I'm not all just saying that they're not useful too. Sepp Holzer did most of his work with machines to, on his bigger landscape projects. So deep bed soil building is basically a term I use for taking, you know, small excavators and putting a lot of organic matter and a lot of minerals into the ground and tilting it in deep so those minerals are stored deep in the soil uh, where they're going to be available for a long time. So that's what that is. There's a lot of ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Blessings. Let's go out and, and make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm.